Okay, so the leaders of China and Canada are talking, and our guest, who's normally based in Singapore, is paying us a visit. He follows global markets for his Asian clientele, and he's here to discuss some trading ideas based on the rise of the Chinese consumer. Here's Mark Keenan, Head of Commodities Research for Asia at Societe Generale. Great to see you. Good morning, Andrew. So you're normally based in Singapore. I'm, I'm, I'm normally based in Singapore, and, yes, and, and visiting your wonderful country yeah. here. First time in Canada, and first you're very welcome. Canada. Yeah, thank you. And is Singapore a good place to track commodity flows in Asia? Look, it's a, it's a fantastic place. I mean, it sits on the doorstep of, of China and India, uh, a billion people in each. And you gain uh, and see fantastic insights um, into what's going on. And now with India turning around slowly, you know, there's a lot of interest there mm -hmm. on where that's developing. But it's a fascinating place. So we've heard a lot that the Chinese economy is switching from building roads and bridges and basic infrastructure to more consumer-led growth. Is that true? And, and will it really play out in commodities? Yes, it is. I mean, we, we, we grappled with that question um, some time ago when it was originally announced uh, by the Chinese government some years ago. They're very clear on how they, 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 they make, you know, communicate what their intentions are with the economy. And we first saw um, with oil products, for example, back in 2012, if you look at the consumption of the lighter ends of the barrel, uh, products linked more to consumer-driven activity, mm -hmm. things like gasoline, jet fuel, LPG, and so on, as opposed to the heavy ends of the barrel, the residual fuel or the gas, or linked to heavy machinery sort of work. We saw a, a, quite a significant separation in the demand for the light versus the heavy ends. And we're now seeing that um, with metals. Um, which was always on the cards, but it's come with a little bit of a lag. So we're seeing the more consumer-orientated metals like zinc and, uh, 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 and lead, to a certain extent, doing very well this year. I mean, zinc's been up almost 50% mm. year-to-date. It is high. And then the metals linked more to the, consumer, more to the in infrastructural lead growth models, things like copper, aluminium, um, suffering a bit. There's, of course, also massive oversupply of copper, you know, globally that's, that's pushing this picture. But there is huge differentiation within the sector now. You, you say, uh, Sokja, and I know in your latest trading suggestions, you say hold off on zinc for now until it's dipped a little. Do you think the run may be too much for, uh, in the short term? Potentially too much in the short term. It's, uh, it's, it's very crowded at the moment with a lot of speculative money. Um, but it is, it is, it is fallen a little bit. I mean, we still see about another $300 um, uh, a ton from current levels to Q4 of this year. So meaningful upside, up to about 2,600. And if, for example, you go long zinc and short copper, which is one of the, the things that we suggest doing, we see about $500 of downside in copper. So blended together, that's a very nice relative value trade to capture this uh, developing dynamic. Okay, let's talk about oil. Um, now, how are a a Asian... Um, Oil, potential Asian oil investors, they're looking at the curve, the futures curve. Right now we're in contango, which is unusual. Remind us what that means and why it's holding Asian investors out of the market. Yes, investor, commodity investors, as distinct from the sort of consumer producer driven community, what they do is they, 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 they invest in commodities for the long term. And this typically means that they buy futures contracts or commodity indices whose underlyings are also futures contracts. Which means that as these futures contracts expire, they're then forced to sell out of them as they, as they fall down the curve in a contangled environment, which means that your near-term prices are much cheaper than your longer-term right. prices. So as you're forced to roll your position, you keep having to invest in ever more expensive contracts. Mm -hmm. And that roll yield is, is preclusive. It's called negative roll yield in such instance. So it's, it's, it, it can erode your investment significantly. So to give you some idea, if you take the Bloomberg Commodity Index, which is a balanced, diversified exposure to commodities, and typically the port of call for many investors, endowments, pension funds, and so on. If you look at the return of that, excluding any roll yield, year to date, that's up 16%. But if you bring in all the costs that you would incur by having to roll these features, because so many of the curves are in contango. To actually invest in Exactly, the exactly. Yeah. It's only up 9%. 
So what, what's happening is that in Asia, it's interesting, sentiment is positive. Um, it's helped by gold. Gold has done a fantastic job this year. There's a lot of people sitting on the sidelines, mindful of what's happening in the US with this rebalancing of the shale production, and keen to get involved. I mean, commodities are doing well. It's for the first time in, what, five years now that you're seeing a bit of a turnaround. First time in three years, you're seeing flows. About 50 billion of flows already into the asset class. So when, when the curves start to flatten a little bit and be, be less upwardly sloping, less contangoed, then you stand a chance at attracting some of that money because you won't have this negative roll yield um, to, uh, to erode your return. And just to get back to China for a second, um, talking about the drivers of economic growth changing, you've done a chart here, and maybe you could, uh, you could explain what these inputs are and what pattern we're seeing. Yes. Let's um, put that one up. Yes, so we've, we've spent you know, quite some time trying to help our clients really understand um, what is driving the asset okay. class. And this is really can be best thought of as sort of an X-ray of the Bloomberg Commodity Index. So on the Y-axis there, you have the total variance in the asset class. And on the, the X-axis, you have the time over the last since 2008. Light blue means that commodities are driven by fundamentals, supply and demand, things that commodity market participants understand and can work with. And these colors that, that encroach out of the x-axis there, this is the macro-driven risk-on-risk-off sentiment that's so damaging to commodity mm -hmm. markets. And the, the brown there shows the, the, the influence of currencies. So what we, what we try and do is we, is, we, is we show this to clients and we try and use this to time investments into the asset class um, so that they can, they, can, uh, they, can, they can build these long positions by sometimes using these big moves in macro, in macro and currency dynamics to, to give advantageous entry points. And are we at one now then from well, that at, chart? Well, at the moment, it's, it's particularly different. As you can see, you know, the latter half of the, the extreme right of that chart is about 50% of the chart is, is, has these colors in it, which means that 50% of the asset class is vulnerable to macro and currency movements, mm -hmm. which makes it difficult. And the other half is 50% is fundamental. So what we need to do, stage two, is to look at other indicators Mm -hmm. to try and help us manage you know, changes in this macro environment, things like you know, volatility indices, like policy uncertainty indices. And when we look at these in collaboration with this kind of information, mm -hmm. we're then able to identify weakness and good you know, entry points for people considering a, a longer term exposure to commodities. And you don't think China's in for a crash, a, a massive property bubble, exploding bad assets in the banks? You don't think that they're headed that way? No. Um, I think that the credit injection this year that we've had that's probably not going to continue much beyond Q3 has certainly helped um, the country uh, 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 quite significantly. And we've seen that, you know, even maintaining a lot of the infrastructural development projects, things like copper into the electric grid and so on. Um, we originally had a Chinese hard landing probability of about 30 percent. Uh, we've now delayed that till next year and downsized it to 20 percent. On the positive side, we see an 80 percent probability of it, it being fine. Okay. It's going to be a bumpy rebalancing. Naturally, there's huge work to, done, there's huge to be done. There's huge structural reforms that need to happen. But it's slowing. Um, it's becoming a more robust growth model. It, China's no longer going to be the sole engine of commodity demand in Asia. We now need to look at other places like India, you know, the ASEAN 5, you know, creeping up in the shadows, um, which, which are going to add this, this breadth to the, to the entire continent. Yeah, we kind of forget about those economies, but you visit those cities and they've got big new infrastructure. It's phenomenal what's putting going in on. More. Phenomenal yeah. going. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Andrew. Our guest has been Mark Keenan, and he's head of commodities research for Asia at Societe Generale.